Welcome, Tale Tellers, to your daily horror drama episode. Do you know what part we're up to? Hmm? Part 3 out of 4 for the story What Really Happened to Andersonsburg in 1829 by the Tale Teller, the Jesse Clark. Today's story is intense, just like part 2. Before we jump in, I want to say a special thank you for those in the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. Thank you so much. Amongst all the countries listening to this channel, you guys top them all. Cheers. Now, let's get into my thank yous. We have Troy Shaw. Thank you for listening to this channel, mate. And thank you for being such an awesome fan. You rock. Arkin Brother, also known as Jace York. Holy crap. <laughs> Talk about another dedicated fan. He's written stories, sent me fan art, and shared me around. And maybe that's not what I really mean, but you know what I mean. Thank you so much, mate. We'll be working with you in the near future for sure. The Mad Catter! A top bloke who I've collaborated with. Definitely worth your time. We've got some new podcasts supporting this channel. Just in time with JNT Baggers, a podcast that casually talks about all things weird and funny. A great podcast to unwind to. The Mockers Podcast, a special shout out to you guys. Thanks for the repost and like. Seriously, that's really kind of you. If you're looking for a weekly fix of pop culture, sports, TV and music and more, check out this podcast. You won't be disappointed. The Crazy Town Podcast, love these guys. Be sure to check out their latest wacky and weird episode about an $80,000 Facebook post. Yes, it's exactly as strange and wacky as it sounds. And lastly, John Yentes, who is an instrumentalist and musician who was kind enough to send a like my way. Cheers, buddy. So tell tellers, if you're having a blah sort of day, or a meh sort of night, and people are getting on your nerves, or you're traveling, oh yeah, I know how it feels, turn the distractions off, the sound up, and listen to something different. This morning, some of the wives pitched in with medical aid, and a big, hearty breakfast. So we ate well, and Commander Downs allowed us to spend time with our families, Maria and I took a nice stroll, but I didn't have much to say. By midday, I was back at the palisade with the other men, and by sundown, we were starting to hear the infected getting riled up again, hearing that awful howling. Downs and his aides were riding back and forth, making sure the walls were good and solid. Men, test those walls! Make sure they're nice and strong! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The yes, cannons sir. reloaded and manned and the bell tower watch was keeping his eye out. And this time, we got some of the younger boys to run ammo up and down where it's needed. Shooting started. We'll update if possible. God help us. The infected hit us at all sides, all at once. Them cannons were firing like mad, and Commander Downs was telling them, Quick, men, aim for the trees. So they did. And after a few rounds, they managed to dam off the entry points and slow down the horde, but it weren't more than a stopgap. Them infected were running through the musket smoke, howling and screaming for food. Some of them were galloping towards the walls on all fours and you could see the red of their eyes, like pulling blood. Jim Isley was one of them, and I had to be the poor bastard to put him down for good. I'm sorry Jim, truly, I am. But they kept right on coming. The boys were firing wildly and chopping and stabbing and screaming, and then an infected was doing the same and trying to mount the palisades. And then, just when there weren't a lick more we could take, we heard some of the men screaming from down south of us. We wasn't aware we were even threatened there, but sure enough, them infected bastards had broken on through some of the pickets and were trying to break in through the windows of the houses. So Commander Down sent me and five other gents to go and put a stop to that. You five lads, get to it. We burst in through the houses and stabbed them through the windows and traded shots for rocks over barrels. I got all good and cut up from the exploding glass windows, but I ain't been bit. Not yet. So we put a stop to them coming in that way. But when I got back in, I explained to Downs real good that they were going to try that again sooner or later. And we needed a good force of men to guard up there. Turns out, He'd got similar reports from other parts of town though, and so we'd have to stretch our lines real thin to cover it all up. But we did what we had to do, 
and by God we held the line all around the town, by the skin of our teeth. Some of the men, God above, grown men, some of them are crying. They're so damn tired and scared. We all are. But we held the line. By God we did. Ain't a man here who didn't do his duty. Twenty eight April eighteen twenty nine. Today, the women and children helped us all build a new defensive line towards the centre of town. Down says Men, if we get hit like we did last night, we'll have these palisades and trenches to fall back on. I work with Maria today, digging away. She tended to my wounds too. And we just enjoyed each other's company as we worked. I even got some shut eye. Some real good shut eye, if not but for an hour or two. Then it was sundown again. The boys and I ate up a stew the women cooked up, and then we were off to the palisades. Them wooden posts were beaten and worn too. We knew we couldn't stay for long, and as soon as the howling started from the trees, Commander Downs ordered the twelve pounders be stripped and rushed to the inner line of the defense. Take them apart and rush them to the inner line of defense so they'd be ready if it gets bad. Or when it gets bad, I suppose I'll say. I made sure to kiss Maria real good tonight, and made her promise to make a good run for it if those church bells rang twice, which now meant the inner line had been breached. She cried and nodded. I wanted to tell her that if she had to run, I'd meet her at Joseph's house in Philadelphia. But all I could bring myself to say aloud was, Maria, you run straight for Joseph's, you hear? Cause Lord, and I'm tearing up writing this down, I don't know if I'll last the night. We at the inner line of defense now. We ain't been hit that hard since the battle started. Got above, it was a bloody mess. The rush started off with some infected leaping out of them woods and tackling the lamps into the ground. The glass broke, and all the dry weeds go in a flame. Soon the fire smoking and the musket smoke made it so we couldn't see a damn thing out there. Adam, hey, hey, can you see anything? I can't see a thing. It's too smoggy. Must have been a thousand of those bastards tonight. Maybe more. So we'd been shooting for a good while, and hacking and throwing rocks. And then we heard the commotion up at the other wall. And boy, we knew it weren't no small thing. There were men screaming, and the shooting all together stopped up there. So we knew they were done for. And Commander Downs rides up to us and he says, The Northwest Palisade is breached! Fall back! Fall back! And so me and the boys pick up our guns and beat a fight and retreat down the boulevard towards the inner walls. Then the infected started pouring over the palisades, and we knew there weren't no throwing them back. Not this time. So we get back to the inner palisade and we start right up again, shooting and firing those 12 pounders. And them infected are coming at us from every side now. Howling the whole time, burning up and getting shot all up, but still running at us. Now we got kids in the camp, and I can hear the little lads and lasses putting up a good old cry over the din of the fight. And I thinks, how's it we ain't sent them little ones off to Philadelphia? How's they still here? Maybe it's cause Downs thinks their presence will inspire us, you know, to fight even harder. Anyways, after about a good more hour or two shooting and stabbing, the horde dwindles a bit. And that's when Briggs sees it. One of them infected, mounted up on a dead horse. Looking down on the town, from atop the wooded hill north of town, we only saw his silhouette and those red eyes peering at us through all the smoke and flame. But he's there, right as rain. Briggs points, and we all look, and we gotta catch our breath in our throats. <gasps> them infected got themselves a general, from the looks of it. He's just sitting up there, watching his plague runners set the town ablaze. Not too long after that, some sunlight comes up over the church tower, and the hordes fall back. But we don't know how far. We don't know if they's run back to the trees, or if they's still inside the town, staying in our houses till dark. Down says, We can't spare a soul to go down there and look. So here, we stay. Here in the inner palisade, by the edge of the town, and we waits for nightfall, and that infected up on the horse. 
29 April, 1829. So, I got some sleep this afternoon. Not a whole hell of a lot, but a better amount than none. First thing I did when I woke was help count ammo. We's almost clean out. Maybe 10 rounds a man and and now we's only got 70 men or so. And them 12 pounders is almost out too. They only has maybe 12 balls left to shoot between the two of them. And none of the riders have gotten back. Neither. So, we ain't got no reinforcements coming. So Briggs and I, and Peyton and Short, we goes up to Commander Downs, and we says, Sir, we're almost out of men and ammo. And we got little ones here, sir. And our wives. And the town's all up in flames, sir. There ain't nothing left for us here. Not for a one of us. We should make a run for Philadelphia whilst we still got daylight. But he says back, I ain't never left the enemy in command of my field. We stay and we fight. And he rides off. Now, I ain't no mutineer. Lord above knows I done my duty. But I ain't aiming to die for the principle of it. Not when I got my Maria here and no town left to defend. So I talks to some of the men and women and lay it out for them. And I says, look here boys. We ain't lasting another night and if we do, what will come for us in the next one? We gots to get out while we still can. The road to Philadelphia is still open and we still got ourselves enough daylight to get out of the woods and to the open road before nightfall. And the majority of them nod and we take a vote. The motion to leave is the clear winner. So we get our things and we tell Commander Downs, we's leaving sir, there ain't nothing here left for us and we ain't aiming to die for a pile of rubble. And he gets red in the face and he says back, I'll have the lot of you hanged for treason. And he calls up his boys, about half the men left with their muskets, and he says, You lot, arrest them mutineers, you hear? And so they advance, and we level our muskets to repel them back. But before any shots are fired, one of the women in the church points down the road heading off to the southeast, and she says, Look, one of the scouts is riding in. So we all turn to look, and sure enough, Old David Benjamin's pulling up into town, and he looks like hell itself. He says, Water! Water! And we gives him a canteen, and then he says, I was coming up with a column of state militia from the Midland. All's the help I could muster up. But them infecteds. They're everywhere. (coughs) All over the road. Out in force. I swear... They was lying in wait for the lot of us, like an ambush, and they leapt down on the main road and just tore into the poor lads. They didn't have a chance. I'm the only man to have made it back. I need to tell y'all that the road to Philadelphia is blocked. So now the whole damn town is in a panic. We're surrounded by the plague, and there ain't no way out. And not a minute ago, while I was writing this here entry, Someone points up the hill north of town and then says, There! The horseman! And we all looks and there he is, the plague rider, eyeing the town with that wicked red steer of his, and that of his horse. And we sees he's got a whole wretched host of other infected riders, and then they start moving, right on down the mountains towards us. Then the howling started, and just now, the church bell started to ring. I know it in my bones. I ain't surviving this night. They coming at us from all sides now, and I'm holding Maria tight, and she's crying too. And all we can hear is the wailing of the little ones from the church, and the shouts of the boys as they run up to the palisade with their guns, and the wheeling forward of a cannon. So I gave Maria a kiss, and I'm leaving this here diary in her possession, and some parting words to my love. I love you, darling. I love you, and I hope... You know that. Wow. Just wow. I absolutely loved this story. You see, I have a passion for stories and a niche love for stories with journals. There's something about journals that feels so authentic. The raw account of someone's experience. Like shaky or handy cam for a novel. It brings a sense of voyeurism and intensity that other stories sometimes just don't have. So thank you to our tale teller, the Jesse Clark. Very, very talented writer. Just like Jace York. 
a quick plug moment. Did you enjoy this episode? Did you hate it? You know what? I want to know. Send me your feedback with likes, comments, and ratings. And if you're super generous, share it and repost it. So stories like these can reach everyone's ears for free. It's that simple. And also, thank you. Seriously, this channel is growing. And only because of your support, you people listening on the other end are just fantastic. So tell tellers, this is the place where stories live. And you tell tellers come to listen. Enjoy your day or night and join me every weekday for our creepy tradition. And as always, till next time.